I run the spoken word record label Nymphs and Fugs. Uh, we had a big series of live wire events planned uh, to take place all over the country. And the last two were supposed to be in Colchester and Leeds. But obviously uh, the lockdown happened and we weren't able to do them. And we were going to wait for the venues to reopen. But we sort of realised that it would be a long time until the venues reopened. So I decided to do them online instead. So tonight we have what should have been uh, Live Wire Colchester. It's an absolutely fantastic lineup, as I'm sure you've seen. Uh, we have Luke Wright and Molly Naylor and Maria Ferguson. Um, so I know that we've got viewers from all over the shop. Uh, I'm sure we've got viewers from Colchester as well. Uh, what we're doing is we're asking people to donate to Colchester Art Centre. So on the Facebook video description, there should be a link which allows you to donate. Because as you know, like theatres and art centres are really suffering um during the pandemic and colchester art center were really really kind to us they paid the guarantee for us they offered to reschedule and they were just wonderful and the great people anyway so we're doing this gig tonight as a bit of a fundraiser for colchester art center so please click that uh, donations link but also uh, maria and molly very recently uh, released uh, published new books on burning eye and luke has uh, a vast array of merch uh, books and vinyl and stuff as well so please support the artists as well um, I think that's all I need to say. Uh, my phone tells me it's working. My phone tells me that we're live. Um, Molly, I believe, is in Norwich, but I might be corrected later on. Luke is possibly in Bungie and Maria Ferguson is next to me. Hi. Because we live together. <laughs> and we were going to do the big uh, show biz illusion thing where we were on different laptops and you couldn't see each other in shot to make it look like we're in different rooms. But obviously Maria's laptop could hear mine and my laptop could hear Maria. So it didn't really work. And at about 10 to, I changed the whole tech setup, which wasn't nerve wracking at all, was it? Nah. It's totally fine. Not Aggie. <laughs> Not Aggie at all. Um, so yeah, that's all I need to say really. Uh, I hope you enjoy the set tonight. If you're watching back on YouTube or IGTV on Facebook, you can obviously still donate and buy books. It's an ongoing thing. Um, we're not going to have an interval. It should finish at around half past nine. The three acts are going to do about 25 minutes each and I'm not going to do any poems uh, just because it's not about me. It's about these wonderful poets who've agreed to perform tonight. Uh, so up first is Maria Ferguson. Me? Yeah. Do you want to swap chairs? Yeah. Uh, do you want me to do a little bit of a intro? Okay, I'll go, I'll back, be, at, I'll go back out of shot. I'm doing, it, I'm doing this off the top of my head, so if I get it wrong, I'll be in big trouble. Uh, Maria Ferguson is a multi-award winning... Uh, theatre maker and poet from Romford in Essex. Her debut one-woman show, Fat Girls Don't Dance, uh, sold out shows at Edinburgh Fringe and around the country and won Best Spoken Word Show at the Saboteur Awards in 2017. Her follow-up show, Essex Girl, was shortlisted for the prestigious Tony Craze Award at Soho Theatre in 2018 and won Show of the Week at Vault Festival in 2019. Both of those are published as playtexts by Oberon and Maria's debut poetry collection, all Right Girl was published by Burning Eye Books in March this year uh, and she's a wonderful performer and I'm sure you're going to enjoy absolutely every second of her set so please welcome Maria Ferguson. <laughs> there we go I'll just sit down on the other chair shall I? Well done Matt, an excellent um, introduction there, no pressure at all with me sitting right next to you. Um, Hello everyone. This um, I thought this would um, get less weird, but it's absolutely um, no less weird. Uh, <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm going to do my best um, and speak to myself on screen like it's Black Mirror. Um, so yeah, I brought out a poetry collection about two weeks at the most before uh, lockdown. Um, so that was fun. Um, <laughs> waited quite a long time to put it out and then was like oh okay but actually um, I've had an amazing time um, you know do, doing gigs like this online uh, massive props to Luke for doing a gig every day for like for, for, for so long I don't even know how many you did mate but props to you and I also just um, bought Molly's book Stop Trying to Be Fantastic um, but I hate to say, Molly, it is actually fantastic. So I uh, don't know how you feel about that. I'm going to read um, some from, from my book, All Right Girl. Um, so All Right Girl is like a, a greeting, I guess, that I'm very familiar with. Um, where I come from, it doesn't really matter if you're seven or 70. That's how you'll be um, greeted, All Right Girl. 
um, which is, I understand, equally problematic, but also um, provides me with, with great comfort and like nostalgia. Um, and so the whole collection sort of revolves around uh, working class culture, um, stereotypes within the working classes. Um, it's sort of about gender and belonging and uh, my sort of experience of um, entering womanhood, I suppose. Um, so, yeah, I'm just going to I'm going to open with the, the title piece and shut up just chatting on and get to the poems. So this is, all right, girl. It's the call of the blokes I know from trading notes for pints of John Smith's. The relief of another living, breathing thing in an empty pub in January. It's a longing for a lost wife or three, a smile as their palm is graced with change. They hold on a little too long. It's the raise of the hand or curt nod when I see them in the street, away from beer mats and tired stories, tired eyes, rosy cheeks. A greeting in a familiar kitchen, the same questions to follow each time as the poetry, as the love life. It's the cabbie who knows the East End like the freckles on his wife's nose, rolls out names that might impress Jack the Hat, Billy the Bomb. It's the barman on a Saturday night when I said I'd only have one. And my eyes are red and my mouth is dry and all I really want is his voice to be my dad's on the end of the line, miles away, killing time with that question I never know the answer to. Cool, thank you still haven't got used to not having the instant gratification of applause. Matt, give me a round of applause over there. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so yeah, um, I went to see my dad actually, my mum and dad for the first time since uh, Christmas last week, because uh, they live in Cornwall, so that hasn't been uh, possible. And yeah, it, it was absolutely amazing, but I often just want to hear my dad on the phone going, all right, girl. Um, so it was great to, to see them in person. Um, I'm gonna have a bit of gin. Has everyone got a drink? I know you can't answer me, but I hope you have. Alcoholic or not, whatever your preference, nice to have a refreshment. Um, yeah, the other thing I write quite a lot about in this collection is um, friendship, but m more specifically like female friendship and, and the power that I think that that holds. I've had the same best friend since I was uh, like three years old. In fact, she's only just left my front door. She, <laughs> she's, I was supposed to be my Hindu this weekend, um, but you know that's 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 not happening. Um, but I'm doing like a virtual Hindu thing tomorrow, and she, she's brought me around like a package, and she's literally just left my my flat five minutes before I started this. So I thought, you know what, I'll do I'll do the ones about hair. Um, so yeah, I wanted to to write a poem about her and about our friendship, but I quickly realised it's very difficult to put nearly 30 years of um, friendship into one poem. So I split them up um, into five short poems and each poem, um, the title is the age that we were at the time. So I'm just gonna read that, that whole sequence and I hope you enjoy them. 10. We wear green and white check dresses, play off ground touch and scrape our knees. We compare our gummy smiles, count out saved up compensation to buy flying saucers and chocolate limes. We swap food from lunch boxes, decide we'll wear the same top to a party, pretend it's a coincidence. We are both now obsessed with Dalmatians and have matching stationery. We phone each other every day, even on holiday. We want to go to the same big school where our sisters go already, help each other with SATS revision. We discuss in great detail the likelihood of magical creatures' existence. How the Tooth Fairy and Easter Bunny are a bit condescending now, actually. Santa is a maybe. 
Jesus is definitely real. 15. I meet you at the hairdressers. You've just had your highlights done. You are wearing jeans and a tight pink top. I am wearing navy trackies and a baby blue hoodie. We somehow acquire alcohol. Big bottles of Alcopops, WKD and Smirnoff Ice. We are going to meet some boys who called me fat. The one I hate is going out with one of your lot. We have different friendship circles now. We're still best mates, but we've changed. We go under the subway with the booze. The police come and we leg it. I stop once we've lost them and down the bottle. Massive glugs of fizzy, fruity liquid. It bubbles in my belly, then rises to my throat. I retch and it comes easily. A constant stream of blue. 20. We talk on the phone for the first time in weeks. You're in your second year at university and I just started drama school. You ask me if there are a lot of people singing on tables and I say yes, because there are. You have a handful of contact hours a week and a nightclub on campus. I am in school every day from nine to six, mainly screaming at trees. We are both drinking most days and fancy people we shouldn't fancy. You say I should come visit soon. There's a big night coming up with fancy dress. You've learned how to make Skittle vodka and the train's not very expensive. We decide we'll both go as mimes. I'm jealous of your new friends. They sound nice. I miss you, but I don't know how to tell you that. I'm worried that I still haven't had a proper boyfriend, but I don't tell you that either. Before you hang up, you tell me to stop smoking. 25. I call you on a Saturday morning. I haven't been to bed. It's summer and the sun is shining in someone else's garden. It's your birthday and you've gone away with your boyfriend. I am still wearing last night's dress, drinking cider from a champagne flute. He's asked you to marry him. My legs nearly give way. I ask a dozen questions, tears streaming down my cheeks. We agree we'll meet up soon and you'll tell me everything. I put down the phone, go back inside. The others are playing Jenga. They have socks on their hands and penises drawn on their faces in eyeliner. I go and get into bed with two sleeping bodies. I don't know what it means to be in love. 30. We sit in a cafe near your house down the road from our old school. Your little one is sleeping and we are drinking coffee. We have diamonds on our ring fingers. Life is hard and we are happy. She wakes confused and grumpy so we take her to the park. We pass the public toilets where I took my first pregnancy test. We push her on the swings, point to things of interest, speak in one word sentences, doggy, slide, ball. You look at her with love I can't yet comprehend. I am proud of everything that's led us here. There are still monsters hiding underneath our beds. Though you who are blind to her, they don't exist. Cool. Um, can I have a clap, please, Matt? <laughs> I'm just joking. Gary's on the red wine. When you said, what drink you want tonight, Gary's on the red wine. Gary's on the red wine. Good on you, Gary. Go on, son. Um, what, how long have I got, Matt? Uh, oh, I've got about 10, on 10, 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Or 10, 15. Oh. Plenty of time. Right, um, I'll read a few more from the book then, shall I? Um, yeah, so the other thing I write quite a lot about is uh, body image. Um, my first show, Fat Girls Don't Dance, was all about sort of my uh, relationship with my body, my, my relationship with food, uh, what it was like growing up training um, as a dancer, which I did for a, a, a large part of my life. 
sorry, a bit of gin break. Um, and I wrote a lot at the time about um, how, how that was when I was a teenager and sort of the, being a, a young woman. Uh, and in the words of my mum, it's a bit sad. A bit sad, like, yeah, you know, it's very good. You're obviously a very talented writer, but it's a bit sad. Um, so I wanted to sort of write some, some more pieces about body image, but more where I, where I am now. Um, having sort of accepted that that's pretty much always going to be a part of who I am um, but sort of balancing that and managing that um, so I'm going to read this one it's probably still a bit sad sorry mum but um, <laughs> it's also um, one of the most recent um, poems um, you know that, that I, I wrote before publishing the, the book and it's a sestina now I hate it when poets get up and say this is a villanelle this is a sestina but I actually don't care because I uh, worked really hard to make it a sustainer, so here we go. It's called Gargoyles. Now that you love me, my clothes don't fit. I sit with you and drink red wine. I barely look in the mirror. Sometimes the guilt creeps in. You kiss it out of me. You tell me how much you love my body. I believe you every time. I didn't think I'd have the time to find the perfect fit. Spent so many years hating my body, numbed myself with wine. There were gargoyles living inside me, pulling faces in the mirror. You check your rear view mirror. We finally have some time. You don't dare look at me. One eye off the road and you'd have a fit. Backseat clinking with bottles of wine. I am desperate for your body. Are you desperate for mine? My body. I stand naked, you become my mirror, this used to take a bottle of wine, undressing used to slow down time, not knowing if I was the right fit, it put the fear of God in me, never felt natural to me, sharing my naked body, worried it would never fit a man's desire, gargoyles in the mirror, but with you, I take my time, savour it like an expensive wine, we sit and drink red wine, it soothes every part of me. It's moving quickly now, the time. It's taking its toll on my body. You stand with me in front of the mirror. Your arms round my waist, the perfect fit. There will be endless glasses of wine. A constantly changing body. Gargoyles always inside me, showing themselves in the mirror. I will make my peace with the cruel hands of time. Now that I have found somewhere, someone that I fit. Thank you, Matt. So Matt, to ask that for clapping straight away, and a lot of red wine in that one for Gary. Um, so yeah, Sestina basically has like the same words at the end of the lines in each stanza, but they're mixed up. It's really hard to explain, but. Um, yeah, I, did, I felt like I, I'd never written to form, like ever. So I thought, well, I'm going to try and put a couple of form pieces in um, in my collection. And I, I really enjoyed um, like that new challenge. I know Luke does some insane things with form where he only uses what, one vowel. Or, it's just ridiculous. He's very good with form. Um, so what should I do? Yes. Um, I'm going to do this one just because I don't read it that much, but I actually quite like reading it. Um, and yeah, it's about London. I feel like I I write too much about London because I'm I'm from Essex slash East London, whatever, and um, it's a big part of, of me. But I always feel like I'm writing too much about. London and that there's like you know so much more um there and you know the art seemed to be centered in London which isn't uh what should be happening um and yeah I'm gonna read this piece about London <laughs> it's called Primrose Hill um if you don't know Pr Prim Primrose Hill um if you go to the top of it you basically can see on a clear day like the the whole of London Primrose Hill. 
you showed me the whole of London and I wanted to eat it all. So I snapped off the tops of the buildings like breadsticks and made them a part of me. I ate all the pods on the eye, those lions in Trafalgar Square and the river and Tower Bridge. The view went on for miles, a buffet at an expensive wedding, the belly of St Paul's shaking with fear in the haze of an August sky. My mouth opened and closed several times and you thought I was lost for words, but I was trying to swallow it up. The roof of the pub and the buses and the dogs and the foxes. I ate a man in a suit and tie on his way home to his wife and a girl in Wellington boots. It is only now, button popped off my jeans and fought in my zip with a hanger. It occurs to me that actually, I may have gone too far. You feel like it, he feels like he has to do it every time now, which he does. Um, yeah, I feel like um, I've kind of sort of ended my love story with, with London. I actually really feel like I need to get out <laughs> um, of London, but it has that that quality that you just want to consume everything. And it's obviously ne never possible. Um, I'm going to do one more from the collection and then I'm going to do um, a, a new one that I've written recently. Um, this I've never read this poem out loud, but it's in it's in here, and I actually wrote it years ago, and some somehow thought I should include it with the sort of themes going on in this, and realised that I've I've never read it, so I'm I'm going to read it to you, um, Gary with red wine and co. Um, any more drink updates? No, somebody's watching with a rescue pigeon. A rescue pigeon? Is that a thing? Oh, yeah. oh, um, good for you. That's good for you. I hope the rescue pigeon is also enjoying it. Um, it's called My Letters and it's after um, a poet I really, really like called Hugo Williams. Uh, I basically nicked his, his title and basically the whole premise of the poem, so I had to give him a mention. My Letters after Hugo Williams. They are under the bed burning a hole in the carpet again. I can smell the fabric singe. Cigarette lit from hob, 18. Drunk on tequila I bought to impress you. Forgot the lines. Used a sif synthetic lemon I found in the cupboard to ease the taste. It's the last thing I remember. That smell of burning hair. Some I have kept for almost a decade. My handwriting has changed a little. They are tired things and sad. They long to be held by your fingers. They want you to understand, but it's been so long now, and there are so many. These letters I write and do not send. I think you're meant to throw them away, but I never get that far. They're hiding under bank statements, photographs, receipts, self-destructing, overheating, I taste it on my tongue, Saxa, cheap tequila. You sat on my bed that night, asked me what was burning. Cool. So, thank you. <laughs> Such a wind up now. Um, so yeah, if you like any of that, then uh, this is my nan's balcony down the road from where I am now. This used to be West Ham United's football ground before they tore it down in a building flat. So there we go. A bit of gentrification there. Um, I'm going to finish now. Got time, Matt? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to finish now just with like a really short poem. Um, I've been doing workshops, writing workshops during lockdown. Um, not running them, going to them. Um, I've run a couple, but um, I go to one. Uh, most weeks with C Cecilia Knapp, who's amazing poet. You should check her out. And um, this one actually came out of a um, workshop with Jemima Foxtrot, who is also amazing. Check her out. Um, and we were sort of writing about joy, but about sort of like 
small joy the the things in life is the small miracles that bring you joy but you never talk about them they, they just make you feel joyous can be the lights the, the tiniest things and I think at the moment it's just like so important to soak up that joy just wherever you find it just soak it up like a massive sponge um because it's just few and far between at the minute and it um so yeah this is a little little one but, uh, about that and then I'll, I'll go and leave you to the other wonderful poets um it's called 71a I turn on the radio and it plays a song I like. The sun is trickling through the kitchen window onto a bamboo plant my sister sent last week. It sits there on the windowsill, doing its best to live. The chicken defrosts in a white bowl on the aging wooden table. The dishes are drying next to the sink. Bananas over-ripening just the way I like. Hobnobs waiting patiently in their packet next to the tea bags. Glory be. You are working in the next room. Tap, tap, tapping away on plastic keys with letters on. Pausing every now and then to rub your aching neck. Here we all are. Existing doing our very best. The radio plays another song. I start to sing. Way! Thank you, Matt. An extra big one. Thank you so much, everyone. I can't wait to hear Molly and Luke. And um, yeah, see you on the other side, babes. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria Ferguson. That was absolutely fantastic. That was lovely. And you've had some great replies online as well. People have been commenting, very kindly commenting and sending the love. Um, yeah, so that was Maria, which means that next up, uh, we will be having a set from Molly Naylor. Give me two secs. Just getting all my tech stuff started. I'm not used to doing all this tech stuff. So, um, Molly, uh, let's have a quick look. Uh, da, 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 da. Are you are you ready, Molly? Do you want to leave a message in the chat just to let us know you're ready in case I introduce you and then it's like, ah. Da, da, da. Let's have a quick check. Cool. So. Yeah. Okay. So. Molly Naylor is an award-winning writer, performer, and director. Uh, she is the creator and co-writer of Sky One Comedy After Hours. Her theatre work includes Whenever I Get Blown Up, I Think of You, uh, writer-performer, My Robot Heart, writer-performer, and Lights, Planet, People, writer-director. Um, and as I said earlier, Molly's new poetry collection, Stop Trying to Be Fantastic, was published by Bernie Nye very recently. And finally, Molly is the co-director of the sellout storytelling night, True Stories Live, which I believe you can see uh, in Norwich Arts and, uh, and other places. So please welcome Molly Naylor. I'll wait for you to appear and then I shall make myself disappear. That's weird. Oh. Hi. Thank you uh, ah. so much for having me. This is obviously weird. Uh, it's going to be great. And, and I'm just like doing gigs and it's like going. <sighs> is that working? Can you hear me, Matt? Because I'm um, really yeah. a bit weird. It was going a little bit slow, but you were fine earlier. Um... I've turned my video off now, so hopefully it should be okay. Okay. Well, should I just carry on? <laughs> sounds great. It sounds great now. Maybe it was just adjusting to your camera going live. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, uh, I'm just going to carry on talking and hope that it works. Okay. So, hi, everybody. Um, thank you for having me. This is really lush. Um, so, I, yeah, I desperately miss... Um, like going out and I know we're allowed to go out a little bit now 
but um, I don't know about you, but I can't get very excited about the idea of a socially distant picnic. Do you know what I mean? Like, and what I miss is those like, do you remember those nights out where like you, you start off going for one pint and then it turns into two pints and then it turns into like some crazy shenanigans. So this is, I've written you a poem about the night out that we're gonna have when we're allowed to have night outs again. It's called Tonight. Come out with me tonight. Come out tonight, come not just out, but out, out. For delicious hiding, for best versions, big moves, fast choices. The night is crunchy, inviting, open for business, constantly tilting, enemy of dawn. Come out tonight, let's climb down untethered drain pipes. Let's swim in celebrated oceans. Let's get admitted to literary hospitals. Let's make out with Bauhaus waitresses. Let's cross serendipitous bridges. Let's drink milkshakes in graveyards. The night is a smash lamp, an empty inbox, a harmless explosion, a flammable cactus, a backlog a tower, an indigo dickhead, and it never ends until it does. Then dawn insists, morning hits. Ugh, morning, that brutalist cruise ship, that perky entrepreneur, that confronting leotard, that demoralizing saxophone, that naked seminar, that opportunity for growth. I'd love to love daytime, but I'm mourning the starlight. Please say you'll come out with me tonight. Thank you. I'm imagining your rapturous applause at home. Um, yeah, it's gonna be a while, eh? but it's gonna be, it's gonna be fucking mint when we can do it. Um, all right, this uh, next poem. I feel very sorry for you if you are in lockdown with a child or specifically with like an annoying child, um, which is a bit of a mean thing to say because like no kids are annoying. They're just being kids, but also they are annoying. Um, and I, when I was a kid, I was very aware that I was annoying. And I don't think that that does you any favors as a kid, because if you know you're annoying, you, you weaponize it. And then it kind of gets worse from there on in. So this is kind of like a cautionary tale about how like you've got to t not let your kids know that they're annoying. Um, I know that like everyone's favorite thing is uh, a woman who doesn't have kids giving them advice on how to raise their kids on Zoom via poetry in a plague. Uh, you're welcome guys. So this is for you, it's called Hey Kid. It's fun to annoy on purpose right up until it's not until you become so good at it that you can't stop. Annoying in the spotlight, annoying as a science, being annoying on purpose and seeing what it does. Recorder club chaos agent, birthday party doom weasel, top of the stairs, eavesdropper horrible at joining in. But then, teenage, you get so obsessed with hiding how annoying you are that you stop moving your body for fear that your organs will shame explode out of your skin because my kidneys are too chubby, my heart is too hearty. And then later, worse, you take up creative writing. Realize how essential it is to be fantastic and push through life asking, is this all right? Is this all right? Is this all right? Cheers. All right, lovely. This is a, I'm gonna do, a, I'm gonna do a, a, it's sort of a love poem now. It's not really a love poem like about person. It's about, it's about trying to fall out of love with a certain type of love, with that kind of early days, exciting, romantic, glittery love that is unsustainable. Um, I've been a bit of a, I've been a bit of a bell end for uh, being obsessed with that, those early days vibes. Um, so I'm trying to grow up. I'm 37. Um, I'm trying to grow the fuck up. This is called Pylons. 
The sun was low in the sky and the forest was sandy and soft and the branches made frames for the pink sky behind and the woods became a beach as wide as the moon and we floated over sand, twin helium blooms. But I, glitter belly nauseous, felt a tug for pylons, concrete, pound land. I don't want to keep bumping into them in last night on earth diners saying over shared milkshakes oh remember helium and the sun hanging low in the sky and the time we believed in something for 30 minutes old cowboys dipping fries into ketchup apocalypse aphrodisiac without the skill to stay put it's hard to love pylons is that why we should looming guards of fields fierce with ugly function steady intricate routine i want to hold hands under them kiss inside a sewage works get over beginnings get under a body that looks like a body work on getting used to living under a flight path when i say i want this i mean i want to want this to loosen my grip on shiny know that new things get old and be still Cool. Thank you so much. Um, like Matt said in his uh, very kind um, <laughs> intro, uh, yeah, I sometimes do a bit of writing for like telly and stuff. And when I was younger, uh, it's like when I was in my 20s, I was like obsessed with like trying to get to the point where I could like write for film and TV and be a script writer. And you know, like when you have an idea of what something's going to be like when you're younger and you really want it. And I was very like clingy and wanty about it. And then like, and then you get it and it's not quite what you expected. I sort of thought that that world, going to like meetings with like TV people, I thought it'd be quite glamorous and exciting and creatively fulfilling. And then what it actually ended up being was like two 25 year old white guys called Josh negging me in an office in Soho. And that wasn't like my childhood dream come true. And a lot of the times like, like nothing happens with these projects, the, the Joshes neg you and then you like fuck off home to Norwich. Um, yeah, I live in Norwich guys, not to brag. And one of the things that the Joshes are obsessed with is like how you can't be alive if you don't live in London. And so, so many of our meetings were them like negging me, uh, talking shit, being actually offensive and, um, and, and not understanding, willfully misunderstanding the concept of Norwich. So, and um, what I've done at the risk of like, and I think what it is, right? I think they're like the gatekeepers and I think the gatekeepers are changing, but like, it's just weird, isn't it? How like those guys are like the gatekeepers to like, the art and i think that's maybe a problem um so yeah uh, what i've done for you is i've written you a list of all the like shit that they've said um and turned that into a poem is that a poem i'm not sure let's find out this is called things said to me in tv meetings so yeah no we like your script good stuff just uh, one thought we had though i mean not this but something what about if we change the gay Make him a tap dancer. Josh here has never met a gay like yours. Could we make him more gay? Or maybe less gay, or maybe not gay? I like your shoes. Are they from the 90s? Norwich. Is that in Cornwall? So, it's quite subtle, this, which we love, but we're not really doing subtle this year because we did too much shuttle last year. And him working in a fruit and veg shop, like, do people actually work in fruit and veg shops? And he's Muslim, is he? Mm, sadly, that won't fly. Okay, so we need you to make this 35% funnier. Also, more trauma, like ideally your trauma, like really get in there, make it bigger, raise those stakes and make it hotter. Was it hot? Should we say it was? Norwich, wild, how do you get there? So, as working class guys from the Surrey Hills area of outstanding beauty, we really relate to this character's struggle, but people won't watch it if she's a woman. We love women, but men don't watch women shows. We do, but men don't. Women rarely do. You remind me of Emma Stone, Emma Bunting. Have you seen The Demon Headmaster? Your script reminds me of that. Have you been to an escape room? Your script reminds me of that. Have you read Lena Dunham's deleted blog post from 2013? Your script reminds me of that. Have you ever had cystitis? This reminds me of that. Have you ever been fucked by somebody who's wearing a Tony Blair mask? This reminds me of that. Have you seen Jaws? This reminds me of that. If Jaws was a man and the sea was all women. So Norwich, 
is that where that guy is from? Oh my God, it's, uh, it's 2.30, we've got a meeting now with someone else, someone better, uh, shinier. What I, I meant different, talented, not work, just, do you want a pastry? Have a pastry. Pastry? Are you sure? Take them, take them all. Why don't you take them anyway? Why don't you give them to Norwich? It is Norwich, isn't it? Waller Bridge, Waller Bridge, Waller Bridge. Thanks tons, exciting stuff. Connect soon. So there we go, there we go, uh, ruining my career by alienating the Joshes. Um, not to worry guys, it will be fine. Uh, we've all lost our careers now, haven't we? So it's gonna be all right, we'll have to figure something else out. Um, okay, right, listen to me. I used to think that I ruined dates by telling the truth, um, like about, about myself. I used to think that if you, if you shared with somebody like, I don't know, like your damage or your fears or your vulnerabilities or your insecurities, then they'd be like, you're a mess and it's really gross and unattractive. So I'm not going to um, want to go out with you. And uh, what I've since realized is that's kind of bullshit because we're all hot messes, right? Like we're all figuring it out. And actually, I'll tell you who I get suspicious of now is the people who don't appear to have anything wrong with them. <laughs> like have anything going on. I'm like, come on, man. Like. We've all got to have a little look at our shit, right? Because if you don't go searching for your shit, your shit is going to come and find you. So um, this is about, yeah, that is called Exhausted by my brilliant solitude. I consider introducing someone to my body and my ghost. Now, I know that's quite a long title, but um, I really struggled to get it as short as it was. So there we go. They don't recommend getting your ghost out for the lads. Not at this age. Ghosts are for fantasists, kids, cannabis confessions parked up by the reservoir in older boys' cars. Adult sized people want to watch long form TV with people who don't look haunted at all. Do you know what? I'm friends with my ghost. We have found a rhythm. She has a certain dystopian charm and she is generous with her cigarettes. And what if this time I've found someone whose ghost gets on with mine? Our ghosts could drink or fuck while we were free to roam. Adventures would be easy. We would fall asleep anywhere. As we both know what's hiding in the dark. Yeah, get yourself to therapy. That's the theme of that little piece. Um, all right, my sweet friends, um, this is my book. It's called Stop Trying to Be Fantastic. And um, like Maria said, ironically, it is quite it is quite good. It's quite a tasty number. Um, so I'd really... <laughs> Why am I being an, an arsehole? I think it's because I can't see you or hear you. So I feel like... I don't know, I'm like overcompensating or something for being like completely alone um, for months. So I'll, I'll stop, but um, yeah, this is my book. You can buy it on my website um, or you can just go to my website and check out some stuff. I have some shows that you can listen to on Bandcamp and blah, 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 blah. Uh, Burning Eye Books, amazing publisher. They publish like a lot of spoken word artists and cool guys. Um, yeah, and Maria's book's gorgeous. Uh, um, Laurie Bulger's book's amazing. Uh, James McDermott's got one coming out um, in like very shortly. They're just great, check them out. Um, but yeah, stop trying to be fantastic. I'm going to read you a poem, which is kind of like, it's sort of not in the book, actually. It's like a bonus that you get with the book. Um, it's about, yeah, it's about, it's about how, how, how we're all trying all of the time. It's tiring, isn't it? Aren't you tired? Um, I noticed a few years ago in the sort of, in the, in the discourse, there's a lot of like, or in the culture, there's a lot of chat about suddenly about like killing it and crushing it and slaying it. And like, I, I hated it because it's like, why do we have to be? Do you know what I mean? Why do we have to be crushing it every single day of our lives? And what does that even mean? Like, I don't want to be a girl boss. I just want to be a fucking human being. Um, so there was like that in the narrative I was hearing a lot. And then, and then I feel like this idea about like self care came along and we were all talking about like self care. Um, but in a sort of very commodified way of like get a scented candle, like have a bubble bath, have a wank in it and you'll be happy. And so I feel like it's like, on the one hand, it's like, you got to crush, you got to kill, and then you got to like buy this 50 pound candle to make up for it. It's like, maybe we could just like collectively lower the bar in terms of our expectations for ourselves and each other. And then we wouldn't need to 
just be fucking uh, having a shit time all the time. Okay, so um, this is the manifesto for that, and it's called You're All Right, and it's for you because you are all you, all you guys. All right. You're all right, you are. You're fine. You're six out of ten. You're medium cheese. Don't love yourself. Accept yourself. Who's got time to love themselves when the floods are coming and there's a new season of Bojack Horseman? You're all right, you are. You're yogurt, and that's fine. You're not a tiramisu, but you don't have to be a tiramisu. Tiramisu for breakfast is too much. You're all right, you are. You're not particularly inspiring, but you're relatively kind, and you don't need to inspire me, actually. Just be nice to me. Don't murder me. Buy me a lager, and just a lager, right? Not like an 8% craft beer with amazing graphic design, just a lager, like Cronenberg, like we used to think was fine. You're all right, you are. You are acceptable, and what more does anyone want? You're an apple. You're fine. You're a biro. It works. Your flowers from the SO, they're still flowers. What are you having for tea tonight? Jack of potato, good. Do that. I know it's not paleo, but you don't have to do paleo. That's for Hollywood and cunts. Going swimming, are you? Doing butterfly, are you? Stop it. Do breaststroke. Breaststroke is good. Stop trying to do butterfly. It's weird. You're all right, you are. There's no shame in you. You're, you're like in Scrabble when someone has a Q and uses it as a spell queen. It's fine. You don't impress me much, and I like that. I don't need to be impressed all the time. I'm 37. I've seen Stonehenge, I've seen a fishy to duck, I've met Robin Ince, just crack on, you're fine. You're all right, you are. I know we're in like a golden age of television, but until we were, we weren't and nobody died. You're not a rich and compelling narrative. You're not better cool soul. You're Dawson's Creek and if we open our hearts, we can find you very poignant. Your art, in a way. You're like, you know, like a painting of a hair or a picture taken by a mum on an iPad. You're all right, you are, you're fine, you're occasionally funny. You're six out of ten. You're an apple, enough. A biro, enough. A yogurt, enough. A hedge, enough. Your hair's nice when you wash it. You're medium cheese. You're a jacket potato, perfectly good. Adequate coffee, 4 99 wine, Cronenberg, breaststroke. I love you, you're fine. Guys, guess what? I'm only bloody drinking Cronenberg. That was a, a mistake. I mean, it wasn't a mistake because I love Cronenberg, but I didn't... Do you know what I mean? I'm not trying to do a thing. Um, all right, I'm going to do one more poem, um, I think. Uh, yeah, I'm going to do one more. Um, and this is, it's called Back to School. And it's, it's just about like all of, it's, I'm sort of imagining like when this is over, and I know that's a hard thing to imagine, but it's everything that I wish for you when this is over. And I wish we have that like crispy autumnal back to school feeling whenever it is. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Matt. And um, enjoy Luke. I love you, Maria. Um, and I hope you're all having a nice evening. Back to school. I wish you clean sheets and fresh thoughts. A little more boldness a little less meekness. A few new ways to clear the clouds from your mind in this, the spring of your life. I wish you the chance to make things that fall apart. Time to breathe in the dying of the leaves. You are the spring in the autumn and the songs you love now will love you forever. I wish you power over your ancient reflexive responses and a sense to hold drunken kisses lightly. Shrug, breathe, do the next thing, then the next. And remember, no one has ever regretted choosing to go for a swim. Thank you very much. Yay, me. Well done, Molly. That was amazing. That was so good. Um, lots of love on Facebook uh, for Molly set, uh, quite rightly, because uh, that was amazing. Um, yeah, Stop Trying to Be Fantastic was published by Bernie Nye, I believe, uh, well, very, very recently. And also Badminton was published by Bernie Nye in 2016. So if you want either of those collections, please do check them out. And as I mentioned at the start, uh, we're also encouraging donations to Colchester Arts Centre. There's a, a link in this event so that you can make donations to Colchester Arts Centre because, as we know, all theatres and art centres are struggling at the moment because of the pandemic. 
uh, we're worried about when we're going to open or even if some of them are going to be able, able to open again. And Colchester Art Centre is one of the best venues in the country. So, so please, if you can afford, um, make a little donation and support the artists as well, uh, Maria and Molly. And then up next, uh, our headline act, uh, Mr. Luke Wright. So uh, Luke was actually first spurred into poetry when he saw Dr. John Cooper Clark performing at Culture Science Centre in 1998. Um, so it's all the more poignant tonight that Luke's performing this Culture Strat Centre gig. Uh, since 1998, obviously, he's become one of the most celebrated live poets of his generation. Uh, he's recently made national news by doing 100 consecutive lockdown gigs, and I know he's still doing regular lockdown gigs even after reaching that total. His shows, uh, The Remains of Logan, Dankworth, Frankie Barr, and What I Learned from Johnny Bevan have got tons of accolades and awards and are all published by Pen in the Margins. And last year, he released an album on 2LP Gatefold vinyl called 20, uh, which celebrated two decades on the stage. And that's available via Nymphs and Thugs. So without further ado, Mr. Luke Wright. Yay, it's me. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I very much enjoyed your set, Maria and Molly, if you're still there. Um, I made notes. I, well, I've, <laughs> I've just written, I've met Robin Ince. That's the only note I made, um, which is good. I have met Robin Ince. Um, I'm missing Robin Ince at the moment, really, uh, because um, Robin Ince, the, the, the comedian and uh, um, bibliophile, because I only ever see him at festivals and... Uh, my friend John and I have this theory that that Robin Ince is like our version of the groundhog and, and that that's well summer can't start unless the groundhog slash Robin Ince emerges from his hole and walks around a, a festival. That was me doing his glasses there. He's got glasses. And um, and this year, because I haven't seen Robin Ince in a field, it means it's not summer. So there's no summer. It's eternal spring. Oh, spring's good, isn't it? Eternal winter. Anyway, I'll, uh, I'll shut up and do some poems. So uh, this one is, I've noticed Molly Naylor's logged off, okay? I just wanna say, I wanna say this for the record, Molly Naylor has logged off, okay? She's done her bit and she's fucked off. Um, the, uh, oh, she's come back, she's come back as if to, uh, as if to uh, taunt me. Right, okay. Um, <laughs> this first one's called Status Update. Just one more minute screen time, please, to check how long my screen time's been. I can't settle. My brain's uninsulated wires fizz under the floorboards, burn up my thoughts like dust motes. Please don't touch that bake light switch. I think we need to get a man in. All these screens, these grim receipts of state as spiked on cluttered desktops of my mind. Today, I spent three hours watching e ink notepads being unboxed. I learned third hand a well known racist commentator said a racist thing. I scrolled until I found the thing, then dived below its line. Let outrage bleach the gutters of my mind. I've heard the brain is wider than the sky. Well, the skies round here are huge and gray and I have nothing to say. I have rendered each stunning vista into wallpaper. I used to think the cynics were the clever ones. That treadmill, low-fat cynicism that sees the fault in everything before they try to reel you in. But cynics don't just see what's wrong. They accept it. I don't know what I want. Can't picture myself 20 years from now. Some hasty thumbs. Erroneous corrections. Fidgeting the flesh clean off my bones. A phatic vocal tick, the ground floor of a tower block, all that weight. <sighs> Cheery stuff, get us going. This next one's uh, about um, the, the, the version of me that, that comes out during the summer months. Um, Molly was talking about her ghost, and I've got a monster. Um, and um, I'd like to say that my monster's been well and truly in his box these last few weeks, uh, but I've been finding little ways to get him out, despite the fact that I can't go to any sort of organised, ticketed kind of versions of fun. I've had to make me own in fields. Monster. I've got a monster in me. Spats and tails and ridiculous jewellery. Fuck yes. My monster can accessorise. And this beautiful bastard is here to sell the night to you. Cocking his leg to lube the chat. 
Watch him dance on a squazonk cans. A double finger gun salute, chest out, arms as wide as Christ. Oi, oi, oi. Lads, lads, lads. Monster. Diatribing like a columnist. Opinions like confetti from an arsehole. Oh, he's atrocious. But he knows this. He called himself out when he chose that shirt and refused to do his buttons up. You can't touch him because he's already touching himself. Monster. Monster. And recently my monster's been escaping every night. I can't be asked to latch his cage. I thrill to hear the steel door clank. Yeah, this old screw has turned. I thump my chest at five o'clock to wake him up. Sun's over the yard, our monster. Grease your hair and ditch your sponsor. The monster's coming out. Oi, 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 lads, lads, lads. The monster's coming out. Oh, my God, the monster's coming out. Delighting in the tang of human skin and swimming in the eyes of strangers. He loves you all. He wants you all. He wants to take you home with him. He wants to take you home. Come the acid morning, he'll be snoring. Grinning hard at some old filthy dream inside my chest. Well, I take tea with him. Afraid to ask. Monster. I showed him another. I wrote craft beer down. That was another note. I don't want to speak about that. I think because I'm drinking a craft beer. I have a little metal cup that I like at a festival. I keep mentioning festivals. I've obviously got on the mind. Sort of right in the middle of that bit where I'd want last weekend, I would have been at Latitude, and this coming weekend, I'm generally at Port Elliot, <sighs> the sadly demised Port, Port Elliot. Um, and so I'm missing it. You don't care, we don't care about this shit, Luke. I'm sorry, but I do, I'm thinking about it quite a lot. I put a shirt on tonight, look, made the effort, it's a bit tight to be honest. I can't be piled on the pounds, it looks quite professional, doesn't it? But look, look at this, right? This. Draw sting, draw string trousers. That's not professional. I'm basically wearing tracksuit bottoms. What's happened to me? I used to be a dad. I used to be. I used to be. I used to be sartorially excellent. Almost yawn there. I once saw uh, the poet Tim Wells, and I noticed Tim was watching this earlier on. I don't know if he's still watching. Hi Tim, if you're watching. But I once saw Tim Wells yawn on stage. I think that is that is the pinnacle. That's the pinnacle of live performance. When you are that comfortable that you can be in front of a live audience <laughs> and carry on your set. Enough respect. I hope to one day reach that stage. I did yawn during a, a Twitter gig, one of my own Twitter gigs. But, you know, I wasn't letting anyone down. There was no sort of contract in that situation. So, uh, but not yet, not in a live gig. Not here, not with these people watching. Um, so, oh, I can hear... I can hear my children running around upstairs. They're running the tap. I don't know if they're washing their hands. This is a poem about the sea. It's called Tidal. I tried it on again last March, but you slapped me in the face, then cut me dead all April long. By May, we were exchanging pleasantries, and then a blazing June arrived, and I fell drunk into your arms, your salty body folding over mine. After that, I couldn't keep away before and after work, all through July, till August came, mercurial and strange, and every day I felt you growing cooler. We worked at it, through warm September dusks, but soon we were reduced to quickies, fully clothed, which felt the way it always does, like constructive dismissal. All winter now I've watched you from my car, raging, foaming at the mouth, clutching bottles, bodies, lashing out, but I know you, and how you lapped my sandy feet. I know one day you'll take me back, and by the time we roll around to march, I'll be aching for your slap. I don't know what I think about that. It's all right. It's all right. Thing is, I was going to cut it from my, this is going to be my new collection. I was going to cut it. Uh, and then I read it to uh, my partner when we were both off our faces a week ago. She said she really liked it. I went, oh, God, maybe it's good then. Of course, we were off our faces. Everything's great when you're off your face. Anyway, here's a poem about um, kind of my old life, really. My old life of uh, being on the road and uh, missing home and missing my children. I've got two children, an 11-year-old and a uh, eight-year-old. Uh, the eight-year-old, Sam, is mentioned in this poem. And this is uh, 
about a gig I did at a place called The Star Inn in Waldron, which is um, in Sussex, a beautiful pub with lots of, it's like an old coach in. And Waldron is this beautiful, quintessentially Arcadian English, I guess it's a village if it's got a pub and a church, but it feels more like a hamlet when you arrive at it down. Roads unbesmirched by white lines. A pub gig in the middle of nowhere. The locals take a pride in it. No commerce down these silted lanes. A coaching in that's still a coaching in. Fermented, sheltered under hops and shouldering its centuries with all the calm of village cricket. Blokes in whites and wives in hats on yeasty afternoons. And I am here to spin them all some yarns. To tell them things they've known for years and hope the way I do it does the trick. An entertainment older than this horse brass half. And later, in the garden, I meet Daniel. He'd sat there with his parents, sweet and still, all through my show. Seven years old, he tells me. Cherub, almost rendered down to boyhood, and so much like my own son, Sam. A milk-faced storm of cleverness and cheek, which comes at me now with questions like weapons. His father scoops him up, blows raspberries on his stomach sits them at their table with some chips and rips the ketchup sachet. Wholesome chores of parenthood. It's three nights since I made a meal for mine. From the car park, the high wheel feels are endless. In this middle of everywhere, I know the enormity of my choices, the wretched minute realness of being lost at sea. I drive back down the sunken lanes, tunneled by tun through tunnel tunnel through tunnels of trees that taught us a cold moon, and I my boys' car seats in the rear view, empty. And soon enough they'll go. But I'll still witness boys like Daniel, pulling on a hand in Sainsbury's, thwacking teaspoons on Formica in different striplet M4 chains. Perhaps those boys will haunt me. Remind me of a time which I, through work and through divorce, have cleaved in two, have taken half of. Dear God, only half. Hmm. Hmm. There we go. Lovely. Little poem about the older, about the older children there. So, um. I'm just checking that it's all still in line, all working, because you know, I, can't, I can't hear you, or I'm assuming it is, otherwise Matt would have called me on the blower. I can't see you. That's why I do my Twitter gigs, I can, uh, I, I, know, I, know, I know who's watching. I'm just sort of doing this into Zoom, into the ether, which is, you know, no bad thing. Hey, while we're in that sort of uh, little sort of uh, sad little slow place, let's, um, let's do this poem. This is a poem about my dad. Um, my dad uh, is a very different man to me. Doesn't really understand what I do for a job. Can't understand why I'm here now. Certainly can't work out why around about 38 of you have uh, tuned in to watch. Um, but, you know, he supports me in his own way, his own taciturn way. Um, my dad makes things. My dad's a, an amazing engineer and he, um, he, worked, uh, he works with metal and, and wood. And when I was little, he um, made clocks, what they call um, skeleton clocks, which you, know, you can see all the working, you know, very old sort of designs of clocks. And they're displayed under glass domes. And my house had, you know, about sort of, 15 of these and lots of other clocks all dotted around. It's called clocks. Condemned to office work in London, your workshop was your weekend refuge. The thick smell of machine grease, corkscrews of brass filings and the lino, and against the window that colossal lathe, the colour of naval warships. Out of this industrial den emerged the skeleton clocks you'd, ma you'd make from intricate Georgian designs. A hundred perfect bits machined in brass and displayed under the glass domes you'd wear white gloves to lift each Sunday night. Deftly wind each tricky mechanism. And every January you put them forward at the Model Engineers exhibition. Once I thought to stay awake to see you when you came home late. You crept into my room to uncase the gold medal you had won and whispered, pretty good, eh? You let me in. And though I never found the knack for making things or helping in the workshop, I learned from you the pride that comes with skill. 
and it's your clocks that come to mind now as I walk slowly through the cardiac wing, past doorway after doorway, framing grey-skinned men, balding and babyish in hospital gowns, left open at the chest like shirts ripped in bar fights. Almost missing you. So haggard with the IV in your arm. The clocks. I think about the clocks you filled our house with years ago. And we had all that time. Um, this is a very short poem. It's tiny. You don't even have to clap. It's called X. We don't touch each other anymore. 12 years in a double bed down to business-like deals we can't bring ourselves to shake on. Not even an X at the end of a text. I'm not saying that I want to. I just wonder where we went. But today you sent a photo of our son. It stopped me as it flashed across my palm. We were there, in his face, in each other's arms. Which I think presents a fairly sort of a complimentary and positive view of my divorce. Um, so, what, what next? Oh, well, this is a new one, and it, it's so new, in fact, that I've crossed out one ending and had a, had a different ending there. So, you know, it's still kind of... But I thought I'd read it to see what it sounded like when I knew that people were watching. Sure, let's do that then. Merch stall. Uh, it's, it's another one for Sam, actually. Um, I don't know, I, quite, I, I write probably like more poems about Sam than I do about Aidan. Um, which is always, you've got to be careful because the kids go, why, why are you writing? But it's, you know, it's what comes, isn't it? And I think, uh, you know, some are more poems about my dad than I do about my mum, because uh, there's like more of a conflict there. There's sort of more something I can't quite, you know, work out. And, um, you know, Sam and I challenge each other, which is great, actually. Uh, Sam's ambition in life is to beat me at absolutely everything, take my place in the world, all my money, my house, eventually my life, and then bury me. Um, they're, they're, they're his words. Um, <laughs> Um, my lovely Freudian son. So here we are. This is merch store, and this is a merch store as in like you know, flogging stuff after gigs. I flog books and records after gigs. Uh, I flog books and records on behalf of Matt. Really, it's what I do. It's just I do. I bring it home. I go, oh Matt, I brought. I go, oh, God, I made, I made this money, and he go, he takes it, he goes, get out. I said, but what about me? Have a farthing, lad. That's what he's like. It's a true story. Merch store for Sam. I sign the books and you collect the cash. You're careful with it, like you are your love. Falling vacant for a moment as you tally up our profit in your head, then whisper it to me. Up and up it goes, as kind-eyed strangers hand you springy notes, each one a piece of legislation binding us together. The bell rings and our punters drift away. I let you keep a tenner, I gather up the books. I'm just about to click the case shut when you stop me. Lift your eyes to mine and business-like, so serious, you hold your money out. Would it be okay if I bought one? Oh, Sam. Tonight we're millionaires and everything I have is already yours. I think that poem, to an extent, suffers from the fact that the actual moment on which it's based was so emotionally perfect and kind of, you know, that um, it's quite hard to sort of recapture it in words without being cheesy. But um, yes, Molly was talking about being um, caught in lockdown with, with annoying children. Uh, I have two annoying children that I've been in lockdown with quite a lot. Oh yeah. But you know, it's not all bad. I get to smoke at my gigs now. Um, this next one is about something that happened to me when I was 10 years old. Can you imagine? Imagine me, 10 years old. You don't have to really, do you? It's sort of there. It's just like this, like that. I was less fat uh, and slightly less tall, but I was still fucking gargantuan. I was like five foot three when I was 10. I was a freak. And uh, that's, that's an important thing to bear in mind, what happened, given what happened to this story. This is about 
it's called sent out age 10 and it's about you know being, when you sent out a class and i don't think they do this to kids anymore make them stand outside the classroom door sort of all you know when my kids get sent out good lads um they they uh they get like sent to the library or have to go or shame upon shame have to be sent to like a you know like like the baby class and sit in the baby class which my eldest is loves she's like yes yeah, more my sort of pace of things in there so uh but at my school which was a sort of very sort of it was a sort of you know quite austere and cold kind of school it was it was an old sort of stable block converted into a school big state with a massive stable block stable block of sort of like a sort of you know sort of net, i guess what would have been a sort of big stately home um and this bit where i got set out on still had sort of cobblestone floor it was next to where our pegs were we all have pegs my the number of my peg was 64 and if i when i become a formula one driver which i think it's got to be what a season or two away at the most now um my number is going to be 64 Anyway, sent out age 10. I had it coming. One comedy recorder squeak too many. I shrugged and sauntered out. A cocky streaker with a copper's helmet, waving at my classmate crowd and peals of thrilling giggles. But on the flagstones outside the door, it felt like getting stripped for swimming with the year above. As wafting from the dining hall came the suet cabbage smells of the lunch I dreaded. And then the only thing I dreaded more, Mrs. Williams, strictest of our teachers and the headmaster's wife. I shrank into my shoulders, but of course she clipped across to me. Oh, Luke, sent out again. And that was all it took to torch the rafters of my heart and bring the whole lot down. The falling grades and bullying, the old familiar eye sting, then the tears. And as I wept, embarrassed and ashamed, she scooped and lifted the whole of me, my almost adolescent bones, into her arms and cradled them. I still recall her satin blouse, her breasts, and how I almost let her hold me there before disgust surged up in me and writhing, I kick free. It's sort of becoming therapy now, isn't it? What do you think? Was Mrs. Williams a bit untoward there? Um, was she a bit untoward? That's what I want to know. I don't know. Or was she just trying to be nice and sort of got it wrong? I don't know. Anyway, this next one is called um, Now All That Shined Is Shit. Some felon sunk my sovereign son inside his cloudy kecks and given me the slip. Today is doctor's waiting rooms and dog shit on the dance floor. Today, my heartache clings to me like burrs. And everyone's an anti-vaxxer, a queue of cars behind a tractor. Oh, today I'm thatch and Twitter is a tinderbox. The slightest thing might set me off and I could take you all down with me hissing. I'm arguing about Brexit on Reddit. And the lines I bellowed beaming from my handlebars just yesterday are brass so on my tongue. It isn't that it's raining yet. It's knowing rain will come. And I have to give credit to uh, the poet John Osborne because he has a line from many, many years ago from a poem called People Aren't That Happy Anyway, which is a great title for a poem. It was a great title for a book. Um, and he said, you know, in the poem, he's, he's listing things that people do. People aren't that happy anyway, he says. They're arguing about Iraq on internet forums, is the line. And I basically just ripped that off, haven't I? In fact, I think probably I'm arguing about Iraq on Reddit was the original. Anyway, I just changed it a bit. But anyway, full credit to John Osborne. I'll write a proper mea culpa when I publish that poem. Maybe I'll even tell him about it. Okay, so, good. We'll do maybe like, I don't know, like, like cattle mole and then we'll call it a night i can't remember what we, i think we've all kind of gone a bit early on our timing so i don't know whether i've been going on for too long or not long enough and that's the problem with these short poems um it's quite nice to be able to do these gigs when you're sort of just in your you know you're sort of, it feels like a sort of one-on-one -on -one audience and you can do these sort of smaller more fragile pieces so i think so i believe uh, he says as the audience dwindles down um uh, but um they're just they're short and um I haven't got intros for them yet. Have you noticed that? 
this is yeah i don't know i don't know about this next one but we'll see won't we you can you can be the judge of this um and it's called friend request as in like you know like a facebook friend request. You know the facebooks the facebooks right mate to think you still exist are out there now in hideous 4k clarity logging on to zoom and catching up on goggle box in the aluminium twinkle of an eco bulb don't you prefer the past the world beneath a vinyl crackle its edges blurred its fatic chatter rendered down to poetry i could leave you there suspended in the amber of a Polaroid, where our parents, tweed skirted and double cuffed, twiddle the cord of a rotary dial telephone and smoke in the house. But then I think of Colk Abbey, the nursery shut up the day the little Lord inherited the master bedroom. On the rug, a dinky car, abandoned like a goblet at Pompeii. The tyranny of that. quite what i'm trying to say i don't know but i like uh I like the thing about twiddling the cord of a rotary dial telephone this feels a little bit like a like a sort of editing session for my book really isn't it i, I will read the poem and tell you what, what i don't like about the poem and then you my editor needs to tell me that actually no i'm mistaken it's actually a work of uh, genius i'm just too humble to know or you go yeah no, just shut that one out also don't believe editors don't trust them right so I have got this poem in, um, in I've got this poem in, in, in I did a, like a pamphlet thing. The first thing was, a, it was this, this, this big, that's what I'm doing this. It was a pamphlet, um, which I published myself, really guaranteed way of getting, getting your first book out there. Um, and in that pamphlet, I had, I had this poem called Family Funeral, which I was quite keen on. So when it says, so some of the sort of poems we then put into the first collection when I came to be published properly by, by a, a person who wasn't me. Um, and I had this family funeral poem in there and my editor, um, Tom said, oh, no, it's not very good, that one. I went, oh, no, it's not very good, yeah, no. But I still thought it was good, right? I thought, oh, I like that one. So when the second collection came up, um, I just sort of put it in the manuscript of the second collection, didn't say anything, didn't mention the fact that he'd already read it four years before. And he went, yeah, no, I really like this one. I'm going to publish it. So what do they know? It's not, it's, what is it? What, it's nothing, is it, poetry? Anyway, this one's a bit more uh, bouncy no less miserable and it's called we're back at the end again i blew smoke into my drink I've been watching a lot of james bond actually so that's probably why i am uh, yeah pretty yeah pretty suave okay good we're back at the end again Come and whimper, pot-bellied like a cuck. Scroll through everything you know you'll never have. Picture your partner happy, shutting the door in your face. Let it loop like a gif. Your child being thrown in the air by the well-toned arms of a better man. Your mother, drunk, shitting herself at sports day. Go fix point gambling, wanking the train toilets. Go on, it's your birthday. Meet her at the Shell Garage on the South Circular, at the Burger King at Thorough Services. For a month of Tuesday evenings in November, they'd be perfect. Finger each other like 15-year-olds bash teeth with morning breath and talk about the sofas you'll own in your 40s your dream sofas your forever sofas from which you'll submit your letter to graham brady have another donut input the calories stare at the crack face of your iphone your eyes like the spirals of a vending machine straight to dvd resentments ripening like tubercles spend easter weekend with a dozen tv agents and some bloke you assume to be their dealer cheer up kit harrington is on the one show hasn't he done well look at kit harrington oh look at gary he was in that thing you know that thing he was that thing you know that thing look at kit harrington plunder yourself apart we're back at the end again snap that elastic band in the post office queue at parents even the flicking gloom of the village film club julia hartley brewer is here with a strap on go on you know you want to here can be her an optimism and she'll be julia hartley brewer submit like you always do no one hates you mate no one's even noticed we're back at the end again it's tail back to my eyes in both directions feel the heft of your gut the spot on your pubis pull your ugliest face look in the toilet bowl smell the panic seeping from your arm Bits. submit to the sugar tax keep on glugging run your tongue over your furry teeth picture yourself as a four-year-old squinting into the sunlight holding your little spade so unspoiled so sweet that's it good boy right there like that weep
What are you going to do, eh? Log off. We're going to log off, Luke. We're going to log off. Right, OK, so I'm going to do one final poem and then I'll hand you back over to Matt. Uh, we are raising money for Colchester Arts Centre this evening. And what a fine cause. What a fine cause to raise money for. A Colchester Arts Centre um, is, is a beautiful, uh, for those of you who have not been there, it's, it's a beautiful converted church. What's it called? St Mary's in the Wall, it's called. It was St Mary's, St Mary's in the Wall, I think that's right. Um, it's been an art centre since the mid 80s and it has been under the stewardship stewardship of um, Anthony Roberts, uh, Sir Tony Roberts uh, to his friends. And uh, he's been there since I think the 80s or the early 90s anyway. I think maybe just the early 90s actually. Um, and uh, he, run, he runs a great operation now. They you know, do, you know, do all the things art centres do. Um, but he's particularly supportive of artists, he really is. He, you know, he, he sort of goes the extra mile and, and, and being incredibly supportive. To me, um, I, I've done plenty of gigs there. The first time I ever did poetry at um, Culture Arts Centre was in the summer of 1999, and I was violently ignored off stage by the sort of six or seven indie kids. You know, it was, it was like a band all day, and in the middle of you know about 3:30 in the afternoon, the dead spot. I was, I was then put on. Oh, I did my poems at top speed, and um, Anthony Roberts. And the guy who was his, uh, he was his uh, second in command, a guy called Pasco Kedlin, who now runs the Arts Centre in Norwich, were in the audience. And I, I just, this, this gig was, was just, just awful. It was like the worst thing <laughs> I've ever experienced. I was just, it's the hatred and yet silence, the taciturn hatred. It was, uh, it was like being up north. And, uh, <laughs> And and, um, and and Anthony Roberts of the back of this booked me for a gig. He, he, uh, and, he, and, and since then, he has just supported me no end. So the least we can do is do a fucking gig for them. Um, and when lockdown started, Anthony Roberts was reading a different poem every single day over Instagram. And he read one of my poems. And I was like, yeah, of course you have a poem. I'm delighted. I was honoured. Sent me 100 quid. So to be honest, if anything, he's been profligate with, uh, with their finances. And now we have to make up for it. Um, but he is... Um, just a great guy and very supportive of artists and you know the thought that we'd lose cultural arts center is just so give generously give kindly um speech over i am now going to do my final poem uh, it, it was, it's uh, been a delight to do this thank you very much for having me matt um and thank you to maria and to molly um who are great and maria keep on writing about london because you do it so beautifully well um and uh Right, here we go. This one's called The Laybys and the Bypasses. The sun is up again in England, and we've just three strings on our violin, split ends springing from the bow. We're coming down, a dowager in a corridor clutching a faded photo book. But listen now, I know this place. Our song's still beautiful. Let me recite for you. And tell you how we're cast adrift from Europe, mad upon the seas we claim to rule, sat around the port we shiver, red coats threadbare at the elbows, pith helmets abrim with butts and sick. Pray silence for my drunk thumbs. This is England. And I can tell it like it is. Last week, last year, I drove from Sheffield to Deal, five hours without a stop save, pissing in a lay-by outside Luton. My mind a swim in capping pop. I didn't use a map. Oh no, I know this place, I think. I know this place. But what do I know? I know the motorways. I know the laybys and the bypasses. There's life behind those conifers that I will not observe. I spit my whip and split. I pinch myself to stay awake. Two empty car seats in the back. Some days I just see skeleton in a motor. They can't hear you when you scream. So why not scream? I live the life a wide-eyed child chose for me. Perhaps you do as well. Rickety old sleeper trains. We trundle on. We miss the points. So here I am. Another Poundland, Portland. 100 miles from home, watching seagulls swoop like stunt kites on a coast that's not my own. I try my best to make some sense of that. I tally up the good days with the bad. 
I keep my fires smouldering. I shovel on the poems and the admin, the triumphs of my children. I roll my terrors round my palm like bowding bulls. The way the house feels after 9 p.m. The Christmas morning lion. The gigabytes of smiles I dare not open. Because I know what happy is. A carlo full of friends on a festival weekend. A phone call every night. Drifting off our fingertips in touch. Tearing through the long grass of my boys, or standing waist deep in September sea, gasping with the cold, loose, lacerated lungs and a belly full of love. That time I tumbled from a train in Taunton, hungover and hilarious. It must have been June. It really must. The sky was huge and blue. I just adored it. So as it swallowed me, I swallowed it right back. And down the hatch went all of England with it. It knocked me to my knees thinking, yes, I'm here. I'm here. The sky is not caved in. The road is still beneath me and I'm breathing. I claim to know this country. But all I can do is make it in my image. Squeeze it in a spray on jeans. File its teeth, distill its spleen. Take pot shots at its pompousness for sport. I love and loathe it. Like I love and loathe myself. And yes, I know it. Because I know myself. I know myself. That's me done. That's it. It's just the point oh. where uh, Matt comes back. Well, yes. Superb, man. Absolutely brilliant. I love that. I love that poem. That's so good. We've got quite dark in here, though. I know, yeah. It's all right. Um, thank you so much to Luke and to Molly and to Maria as well. Um, thank you all for watching. Uh, we've been between like 40 and 50 viewers all night, which is amazing. I hope that you've been donating. Uh, obviously, the link's in the description. And please buy books and vinyl and all sorts of stuff. And listen to Molly's shows on Bandcamp and all that shit. Um, Wayne and some folks, please follow and share and retweet and subscribe and all that. And yeah, I think that's all I need to say. Uh, you were brilliant. Molly, you were brilliant. Luke, you were brilliant. Maria. Yeah. Jobs are good, and I'm going to drink my shit Carlsberg because it's on offer in Iceland. And that's it. Cool. <laughs> Thank you all. I'll see you later.